Hello and welcome to another series uh, of ultrasound nuggets. And uh, today we are looking at um, your thelio carcinoma and its uh, ultrasound features. My name is David. So when we talk about uh, bladder cancer, we need to realize that this is the most common cancer involving the urinary tract and very common, more common in male than females and less uh, common in those below the age of uh, 40. Patients who normally present uh, with uh, painless uh, hematuria and sometimes with a urine retention and we'll get to understand uh, why that uh, will be so. So the transitional cell carcinoma or also known as uh, urothelial carcinoma is the most common histologic type in the developed world, whilst uh, the squamous cell uh, carcinoma is more common in developing countries. And this is because uh, within the tropics, uh, we have about 600 million people that uh, live there worldwide and about 200 million would get infected uh, with uh, schistosomiasis. And this is mainly because of the uh, the schistosoma hematobium, which uh, invades the urinary bladder and then releases um, uh, uh, eggs. I mean, the, that is the adult worms would release eggs that would cause chronic granulomatous inflammation of the mucosa and submucosa of the urinary bladder. And as we can see from this schematic, we see that uh, the disease may start as a, a focal wall thickening and then progress to invasion of the uh, submucosa and the mucosa. Eventually the mass would also invade uh, the bladder wall and extend outside the urinary uh, bladder. So there is an association, in terms, especially in the developed uh, countries, uh, due to chemical carcinogens that would come from lifestyle um, practices such as smoking or, or occupation exposure to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And like I, I said earlier, in terms of areas where the schistosomiasis is endemic, the disease progression is because that because of the uh, chronic granulomatous inflammation, which would lead to urinary blood fibrosis, this would lead to stasis of uh, urine and uh, bacterial super infection. So the bacteria that is thus uh, uh, formed is responsible for conversion of data in nitrates and nitrites into nitrosamines, which uh, when released, are actually carcinogenic and act on the metaplastic epithelium, which subsequently leads to the progression to squamous cell carcinoma. And uh, if you saw from the previous slide that um, the, the disease as it progresses would actually involve the ureteral openings and uh, once the Ureters are also involved. It means that uh, uh, this would cause uh, chronic obstruction and uh, renal impairment. So, sorry, as we move forward now, this uh, map uh, shows us the distribution in terms of um, uh, schistosomiasis. So we are seeing it involves quite a number of countries around the the, the tropics. So um, countries like I mean uh, Togo, Benin, coming inland, Somalia, Kenya, up north there involving uh, Egypt. We do have a number of literature coming in from Egypt because I think we have the longest river there, river now, and um, even the Great Lakes uh, region. Uh, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, uh, parts of uh, Congo, 
um, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, parts of uh, South Africa, parts of Botswana as well. And this case um, is actually from uh, uh, Botswana. So that is the disease map. Now let's get to the case presentation. Uh, this is a case involving a female 51 uh, with a retroviral disease and one highly active antiretroviral therapy. A patient presented with um, frank hematuria and urine retention. We did allude to the fact that these patients would present uh, with hematuria and sometimes urine retention. Patient was treated with transemic acid, nalitisic acid, diclofenac and paracetamol. Uh, bloods were done, uh, inclu uh, which included C CBC, complete blood count, uh, renal function tests, uh, uh, liver function tests, and an ultrasound of the kidneys and ureters on bladder was uh, requested. Patient was reviewed by, was sent for urology review, and where a biopsy was also done. The ultrasound exam, we use the Mindred DCN3 from Shenzhen, China, cavilinear probes, three to six megahertz, and an endocavitary probe that was um, introduced uh, rectally. Kidneys and urinary bladder were examined in grayscale and with color Doppler, sin loops, and two images were obtained. Our first image here, as we can see um, on your left, is your Transverse section, the other on the right is the longitudinal section, which shows uh, hypoechoic mass with ill defined margins. There is actually areas of low level echoes around here, suggestive of uh, a bladder hematoma, and that would be in keeping clinically with the front hematuria that uh, was observed. So the mass uh, measured six. Uh, 0.21 by 3.97 by 5.4 centimeters, giving a total volume of um, 66 uh, cubic, which is substantially a big uh, um, uh, mass. The color Doppler there does show us um, the, the uh, intralesion of vascularity. And this is uh, an image obtained using an intracavity probe, but introduced um, uh, rectally. Here we see a longitudinal section of the same mass and we can appreciate the low level echoes in that uh, region in keeping with um, hematoma. The bladder wall, as you can see, is actually uh, thickened. So let's have a look at a quick um, uh, video here. So from this video, we can see that mass again and our plate again. Uh, the intralesion of vascularity, irregularity, and the low level echoes. Coming down to the kidney, this is the right kidney and the left kidney. So from this image, we may uh, uh, conclude that actually there was ureteric involvement as we can see that there is a grade one hydronephrosis as uh, uh, evidenced by the dilated uh, calicio uh, system. So in terms of the ultrasound findings, what we pick up as uh, most important is the hypoechoic bladder mass of 66 uh, cubic with ill defined margins. There was bladder wall thickening, bladder hematoma was noted, positive intralesion of vascularity on color Doppler and a grade one unilateral hydronephrosis. So in terms of the lab findings, the viral load was zero copies per milliliter. The patient had a hyper natremia of 144, creatinine was 106. So these two markers, the sodium and creatine does uh, indicate to us that we are dealing with uh, a case that uh, is involving some uh, uh, renal disease. The lactate dehydrogenase, uh, an important um, enzyme in terms of anaerobic um, respiration, is quite elevated. So uh, lactate dehydrogenase, like the isomers, there's one, two, three, four, up to five. Now this is the total one. So if it was uh, one and two would suspect that probably there's a myocardial involvement because um, one would arise from a, a myocardial cell death. But this cell death now would assume that it's arising from other areas, which may include the liver, the kidneys, uh, as well. So as long as the LDH is elevated, we assume that there's definitely some urological injury. So if there's urological injury, 
uh, in this case, we've seen based on the ultrasound that there is a bladder mass uh, which is uh, invading the wall. There is um, uh, hydronephrosis. So all these actually, it does make sense when you look at a lactate dehydrogenase of 224 because uh, sonographically you've seen those markers. The WBC was 6.46, uh, uh, RBC 3.43, so because of the WBC being 6.4, it's within normal limits. So there's definitely no infection. HB of uh, 9.5 relatively down because 10 would be okay because this is a female. Of concern is the red uh, blood cell distribution with O48, which is elevated. And this, remember that when they are a DW, we are looking at the difference in terms of the size and shape between the smallest and the largest red blood cell in a sample. So this is indicative either we have more, uh, a lot of large uh, with red blood or smaller in terms of the differences. So this again is associated with uh, an underlying disease and such as malignancy. So this, based on these lab findings without even histology, it's pointing to us dealing with uh, a possible uh, malignancy. So like I said, the uh, a biopsy was done, which was a two by two by one centimeter aggregate. And what is uh, of particular interest is that these, the section did show malignant epithelial tumors that uh, were, you know, in keeping with typical uh, invasiveness of urothelial carcinoma in terms of its appearance. So in conclusion, we are looking at uh, sonographic features, uh, which eventually now confirmed on biopsy that we are dealing with a malignancy, and this is a urothelial carcinoma or transitional cell carcinoma. So in terms of the patient, because this is an ongoing case, the patient is scheduled for review with oncology for further management. More workup is yet uh, to be done in terms of uh, imaging. So in terms of reflective report, we need to realize that in those areas that were highlighted uh, on the map, but as well as in the developed uh, world, we need to be meticulous in terms of scanning uh, when we're evaluating the kidney, ureters, and blood, and with specific emphasis in terms of the bladder, because usually this would start as a focal uh, bladder uh, wall thickening. So history of smoking, previous or current schistosomiasis infection is quite important for us to actually be able to establish this from the patient. Clinical correlation and lab correlation is important because this was a case of frank hematuria. Uh, and then from the labs, we can see the AODH that is elevated, the hypernatremia, and also the red cell blood distribution uh, that was uh, also elevated, including the creatinine, which was at uh, 106. So MRI does offer superior imaging, but in low resource setting, ultrasound may offer sufficient information and uh, this would be used to then refer the patient for a biopsy when we see suspicious lesions. So genetic sequencing is also essential where available like in the developed countries. So here I'm showing us uh, an image uh, of uh, a 48 year old man who had gross hematuria and cystoscopy showed um, focal thickening near the bladder dome. And uh, biopsy confirmed a muscle invasive urothelial carcinoma. So something that we need to be mindful of is that when we are dealing with um, uh, cases uh, such as this, uh, when you look at MRI, the tumor, the bladder wall, and the perivesical inflammation uh, and uh, fibrous tissue can have a similar signal intensity on T2. So diffusion weighted imaging comes in uh, very handy, and this is because of the presence of uh, restricted diffusion. So in this uh, case, we can see where the arrow is pointing at here is that um, there is uh, evidence uh, of um, um, uh, uh, restricted diffusion, and this is a DWI image. So a study was done by Kobayashi and others, which showed a sensitivity of 88% and specificity of 85% uh, in a study of about 104. So 
a T2 weight uh, MRI alone will, is not sufficient. So we need for those that do MRI diffusion weighted imaging is actually very important uh, in that regard. So when we look at molecular pathways, uh, the take home message is that, you know, the activation of the receptor tyrosine kinase RAS pathways associated with the development of papillary low-grade superficial tumors and mutations of the PIK3CA and um, STAG2 genes associated with uh, high-grade uh, superficial tumors. So this is evidence that comes from molecular imaging, which we call also um, precision uh, imaging. So these early genetic events are actually quite important and can assist us in terms of maybe instituting treatment uh, quite um, early. So these are my references for the presentation uh, uh, given in case you want to read more. And uh, as always, uh, Africa always brings uh, something new from Radiology Without Borders. Thank you so much. Until next time when we have another exciting presentation. Bye.